Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Today we're going to be talking about Our Lady of Fatima. That's right. We're going to explore the apparition of Our Lady of Fatima to three shepherd children in Fatima, Portugal in 1917. The mysterious visions they experienced, the miracles that occurred that were viewed by thousands of people, and so much more. Now these apparitions are fascinating. Six apparitions in total from the month of May to October, but includes apparitions of angels, St. Joseph, and so much more. So you don't want to miss this episode. All right, great topic. Really excited about this. It seems like you know, we've wanted to do this episode for a few years now, and we finally, I think Mary's just kind of made it at the right time. It's appropriate you know? time for, you know, without a doubt, as it relates yeah. to everything that's going on in the world and the rising political tensions in the early 20th century, those political tensions were rising, certainly. Yeah, we're just about 100 years after those, and we're seeing that the conditions that were happening on the ground then are happening now in a very similar fashion. What was the setting of that time, early 20th century Europe, Shiel? Sure. So, you know, the beginning of the 20th century was a time of great upheaval in Europe and the whole world, mm -hmm. right? Uh, this was the middle of the Great War, World War I. I mean, you saw institutions that had been there for thousands of years wiped away, empires, kings, czars, um, war that you had never seen before, mechanized now. Mm -hmm great industrial revolutions, new political ideologies, and it seemed like the whole world was being torn apart. Mm. Um, you saw France and Germany in terrible warfare, Russia in the middle of the war, then experiencing the communist revolution, uh, Austria-Hungary, this great emperor being wiped away, uh, the Ottoman Empire that had been around for a thousand years and it had taken Constant Constantinople, wiped away. Portugal, their king, ousted, and a secular atheist government put in place. I mean, the world was being torn apart. And this is the background of these apparitions of Mary, so centered on mm -hmm. both eschatological, eschatological things and the end of the world, but also peace. Mm -hmm. So it's a very tumultuous, very heavy apparition. Mm. And, you know, the, the sense of, of that setting, Sheila, that you described so perfectly is the setting in which these apparitions take place. As, as I mentioned before, there were six apparitions in total starting from May 1917 until October. And each month, Mary's intention was to appear on the 13th of each month. That's right. To these three very poor shepherd children. Yeah, Francisco and Jacinto, Jacinta Marto and Lucia dos Santos. Jacinta and Francisco were siblings, and then they were cousins with Lucia. That's right. And on the property of Lucia's family, they had the Cova de Ira, right. which was a cove that they would go out, they would be with the, sh the sheep, and- the Grazing fields. Yeah, grazing fields. Yeah. And they went in, they prayed the rosary in the cove, and they were in the fields. And But then on, on May 13th, 1917, they had an experience that, that would really shift the trajectory of what occurred from then to October 13th, which was the great miracle of the sun. So, you know, that first miracle, Sheil, um, what happened to these kids in that cove and, and what was their experience? Sure. So on May 13th, 1917, the shepherd, the shepherd children saw a woman and they described her as all dressed in white, brighter than the sun, shedding rays of lights clearer and stronger than a crystal goblet filled with the most sparkling water and pierced by the burning rays of the sun. Mm. That's an amazing description. Mm. They said the woman wore a white mantle edged with gold and held a rosary in her hand. And she asked them in this first apparition to, vote, to devote themselves to the Holy Trinity and to pray the rosary every day to bring peace to the world and to end the war. So this was a very, number one, I love that description of sparkling water and brighter than the sun through crystal. So it's just like this effervescence and this pure light mm -hmm. with so many fractions of, you know, fractal lights. In it. it's, it's just an astounding thing to think about. And, and the way that you describe the war and the very conditions of, you know, wider Europe 
what what a contrast, like how ugly to to the manifest beauty of this encounter. If you know anything about World War One, you know about trench warfare and trench warfare. World War One is very unique because there's never going to be another war like it. And there never had been a war like it before. It's always going to be this unique encapsulation of this weird time of development of military warfare where you went from horses and lining up like in a field like, you know, the American Revolution to the mechanized meat grinder of modern artillery, trench warfare, mud, barbed wire, lights, pestilence, poisonous gas, mines, mines, uh, zeppelins, dropping bombs. I mean, it was a terrifying war. Mm -hmm. All war is terrifying, but this one was particularly satanic, Mm -hmm. just in the view of it. Yeah, and you think about, I mean, uh, all the Marian apparitions or, you know, like Our Lady Guadalupe, we were really close to that. Um, This this was very explicit, you know. Mm -hmm. it, it, It was very explicit. The, the the reason why she was there well, it was a warning bell yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah and 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 she's communicating peace you right. know she's communicating like don't be afraid yeah you know and and the calming effect of our prayer life with our lady especially you know when we want, when we think about fatima we think about rosary our lady of the rosary because she's calling us to pray the rosary and one of the fruits of praying the rosary and meditating on the mysteries of christ is peace, mm-hmm. and and that ultimately is what she's affecting in the heart of of these children. Now, moving into the second apparition that took place in June. Well, you know, I think something real real important to mention here first is that um, they were supposed to keep these visions secret. Mm-hmm. They were not to tell about this, but uh, Jacinta told her mother, and her mother didn't believe them, mm-hmm. and she was kind of joking. She's like, oh, you know, to her neighbor, like. Yeah, my kids are like, oh, they said they saw this, you know, Mary or whatever. And then, you know how gossip goes, everyone in the whole town knew within Mm -hmm. a day. So there's this big kind of like upheaval, you know, of And there's there's family pressure. Sure. But then that family and, and kind of village pressure continued to grow. As these as these apparitions took place, I, I think I, you told me once there's like the saying that there's two people you never want to visit your diocese, right? Yeah. What is that? <laughs> That's what bishop. I heard I heard somebody say this that that bishops don't want the pope or the blessed mother to visit their diocese, <laughs> right? Because it creates such an upheaval and paperwork. And I think the same would go for parents. It's yeah. like, oh man, I don't know, I don't, because I mean. You know, you have you have kids. I have kids, and they say, "Oh, I, I saw this or that," and you're like, eh, "Okay," yeah. you know, because we're grizzled old parents, and you know, and your immediate thing is to say, "No, you're being fantastical. You're not seeing that." Mm-hmm. But it, it got out so quick that then it started this kind of buzz within this little village. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But they were supposed to keep it secret, but they didn't. So then the parish priest finds out, and the mother took these three kids. Uh, his name was Father Ferreria. And they asked, you know, should they be allowed to go? And he, and said, he said he gave permission. He He's gave like, permission. Go, but he wanted to interview them when they That's came right. back. Which is a very wise and mm-hmm. prudent thing to do, you know? Mm-hmm. And and here you have children that are innocent, mm-hmm. you right. know? Like they don't have intentions that are no, know. like they're they're little, they're you know, and and um, the, and they and they also came from very pious families. Too. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I think from that standpoint that, you know, that's an important. Role. And the fact uh, that these kids would pray the rosary by themselves. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, that, that's, that's really awesome. Special. Yeah. yeah. It's a very, very Catholic special. village. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. But to think that, you know, the parish priest is like, okay, well, let's not just tell these kids that they're making it up. Let's, let's actually see, let's use a little bit Which usually of discernment. Which doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. In apparition. Yeah. Right? But usually this, there's like a, a major force behind yeah. mm-hmm. shutting it down. Well, that's going to happen that, later that in the story. Happen. Yeah. That does happen. The kids are the kids are even jailed. Yeah, you yeah. know, and 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 uh, I mean, how yeah, crazy! That, crazy. It, yeah, but, it is. So this kind of leads into the next the next apparition in June, and this is this is when it's the feast of Saint Anthony. So Saint your Anthony namesake. of Padua, which he was yeah. born at, which yeah. we are going to visit his birthplace on a very pilgrimage. excited about that. Yeah, but um. This is where the the kids are asking because Mary's like, you know, I'm I'm from heaven. You know, she she identifies that I'm from heaven, and the kids are like, can are we able to go to heaven? Mm-hmm. You know, like we wanna we wanna go to heaven, um, and they ask her. You know, and they even ask about friends of theirs who had who had died. Mm-hmm. Are they are they in heaven? Um, and 
what she said was really the prophecy of the death of Jacinta and Francisco. Yeah. So the kids knew that they were going to die soon, um, and she promised that they'll be with her very soon, but Lucia, Lucia is going to remain on earth for many years to promote devotion to the Immaculate Heart, mm. uh, to her Immaculate Heart. I have goosebumps. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's a it's a beautiful uh and, and when you look at again the contrast between these two children that have seen Our Lady and then they they pass away, they predict their own death, and their mother recounts how many times that they expressed to her. But the that peace going to that die. children yeah. had that they knew they were gonna die. Yeah. You know, that there had to be some peace that was given to them from these apparitions mm-hmm. that oh, they sure. weren't feeling this existential dread, oh, right? Yeah, when you're exposed to such beauty and you're right. surrounded by such evil, you can come to really and hate the world very yeah. easily. And your heart is so pure. Yeah, yeah and your heart's so pure, and you want fullness of communion with light from light, mm-hmm. God from God, you know. Yeah. You want to be at one with Our Lady and and th- I mean, how could you not want and that right now? Children suffer death in a very beautiful way. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, they do bring a lot of light. The greater them. suffering is always on the parents. Yeah. Every time Absolutely. I've had to respond, hundred percent. You know, yeah. also in this this second apparition in June, um, Our Lady requested that you pray the Rosary every day every for day. peace in the world. And mm-hmm. you know, one of my earliest memories and a constant memory as a kid was my grandmother every day prayed the Rosary because of the the request of Our Lady of Fatima. Mm-hmm. You know, how many people have prayed rosaries because of this? So very powerful call to action for peace. Mm-hmm. Now, talking about, you know, the, the persecution that was experienced, you know, I, I really want to jump into what you were saying before, Delacrosse, is, you know, like a number of other apparitions, there's a great force against mm-hmm. what's happening. And that didn't come about until August. And... When August 13th rolled around, you know, the administrator of that So time, this would have been the scheduled fourth apparition. Yeah, and, and what happened was the kids were, were brought into captivity, and they were jailed. You know, so here are these little ones, you know. Dangerous little kids. Yeah, and, and, and it's like they're, they were looking at it as, you know, this is, a, this is going to be a political uprising. Yeah. These kids are causing this yeah. political uprising. And... And they they put them into into jail, huh. you know. So that force of of trying to prevent this movement and and the effect of these apparitions, and also is because this is the secular government, and they are now an officially secular government, mm-hmm. yep. and they want to squash religion. And now they've got these kids causing this problem, and you got this provincial governor administrator or Toro Santos, mm-hmm. no relation to Lucia dos Santos, and he's like, look, I want this headache. Don't try to bring this in. It's like, you know, I don't want to, I don't want a, a riot. I just want, you know. Well, and the other thing too it, is he it, reminds me very much of Pontius Pilate, who's just like, I don't want to deal with this. I'm washing my hands. It's mm-hmm. somewhat of an outpost of a village, too. Yeah. And so the political infrastructure, you know, it's like we're 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 gonna throw up these big flags mm-hmm. in this larger system of government, and that's not what I want to do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So on on August 19th. This is the only time that Mary appeared to them that wasn't on the 13th. Um, she appeared and she expressed to pray a lot, you know, that this call to a constancy of prayer for sinners and sacrifice a lot for them. As many souls perish in hell because nobody is praying or making sacrifices for them. Yeah, prayers and acts of reparation for the sins of the world, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're almost It's almost like a call for, call for these little kids to become spiritual Carmelites, right? Mm -hmm. And and Sister Lucia later in life became became a Carmelite. Mm -hmm. You know, these kind of uh, sacrificial souls, these Mm -hmm. souls who would suffer and offer these reparations for the sins of so many people, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mortifications and ascetical practices um, are certainly in the life of, of many religious orders, including the Carmelites. And, you know, Lucia, as well as Francisco and Jacinta, immediately to, began to really put on the ascetical life, even as young people. And again, proving like nobody else is motivating this. Mm-hmm. They're entering into the mortifications of probably at a, at a greater level than many of the other religious orders in their own contemporary time. So to see that and that this is what's motivated out of 
uh, you know, the, these kids' devotions and experiences, that there's something to be said about that in respect to the validity of it. Where else would they be getting these practices that are so well-rooted in, in asceticism and, and religious life? And here's what I love is that when they were brought into that jail, the gut, this administrator is like, I want you to tell me all the secrets. And even the mother was saying, just tell him you're making it up. Just tell him you're making it up. Please let this end. Because, you know, you don't want your kid kind of involved in political intrigue. And, you, you know, you want to fly below the radar. And they're like, we can't tell you. Our, mm -hmm. the, the, the lady in white told us not to. Mm -hmm. But I'll ask her next time if we're allowed to, but I'm not doing it. Little kids in jail mm -hmm. didn't break. Yeah. I mean, and there's, uh -huh. you know, there's, People under interrogations who are a lot less, uh, mm -hmm. have a lesser secret who break a lot easier, yeah. you know? And I'm sure that they were intensely, uh, you know, uh, reprimanding them and yelling at them to, to muster yeah. that out. Yeah, it's, I mean, the kind of courage that took. Oh, yeah, it's amazing. I think that's a, a sign of the certainty that these children had, right? Mm -hmm. That it's like, you know, if, if if they were making it up, I'm telling you, you they would have been scared straight, scared straight like that TV show. You're put in jail. Mm -hmm. Your mom's yelling at you. It's starting to make newspapers. And you start you, crying. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. But yeah. that they were that they were serene and they, they didn't were able, break. They didn't break. Yeah. Uh, so it's amazing. the next apparition then happened September 13th. And she was asking, I, you know, the, the children asked Mary to. Perform a sign, right? Perform a great sign so that people will believe that this is happening. Mm -hmm. And Mary said that she would provide that sign in the next apparition on October 13th, 1917, which is one of the most astounding days in the history of humanity. Um, it's one of the days, it's probably the most widely viewed and attested to miracle maybe ever. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. what I was going to say is usually miracles like... I mean, there's never been anything where God and Mary have enacted such a, a major and event. called their shot, you know, yeah. and said, Hey, this mm -hmm. is happening. And journalists, photographers, atheists, scientists, priests, lay people over be somewhere the estimates between 30,000 and a hundred thousand people gathered in the Cova to see what would happen on this day, mm -hmm. October mm -hmm. seven, October 13th, 1917. And there's, it's well documented, mm -hmm. too. There's pictures. Another, yeah, it's like another uh, wonderful thing about this is that it is it is very well documented. And and we were looking through those pictures just yesterday. Yeah. And They're I'm, fascinating. They are fascinating to look at the faces yeah. of, of these people and their eyes looking at, at and their mouths gaped open. On like, their knees. Yeah. And yeah. it, just the look in their faces is like, this is something different. Yeah. So here, the, what happened at this apparition uh, was really astounding. And I don't think a lot of people know really the full scope and the breadth of what they were seeing. You know, everyone knows about what happened, the miracle of the sun. But this miracle was a lot more in depth, a lot more visionary. It's almost, to me, has the feel of like the book of Revelation where you're just seeing heaven open and the veil the torn apart yeah. and you're just seeing these great signs and visions in the sky. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's true. And, you know, the, the experience of this miracle, like Sheil was saying, that, that happened before tens of thousands of people, people had varying experiences. So the setting of this day, you know, it was rainy, it was nasty, it was cloudy, it was dark. And and it's very symbolic of what was happening all throughout Europe and the, and the darkness and not seeing through where is all this warfare going to go? Where's this violence all going to go? And, you know, then this the light started to shine through and spread out and the rain stopped and this miracle took place of the sun and just many reports of experiences of, of this different shading of light and the movement of the sun and like that sense of the dancing mm -hmm. sun is what comes from the, from this uh, period of time. You're right. So like all these people gather and it's this rainy, gloomy day and it's just like Mary's going to appear in this and then the clouds rip open and then you see the sun, but everyone described the sun as being smaller and paler. And one of the things is that you could look right at the sun. I mean, You've tried looking at the sun, it'll, you have to turn away after a second. But they said the sun was small and pale and just kind of very opaque. But then all of a sudden they started seeing that multicolored lights were being cast everywhere, mm -hmm. almost like that that 
that description earlier of like through a fractal, right? Uh, and on the clouds, so you're seeing all these multicolored lights. And I remember talking to this nun once who had a near-death experience. She said, the thing that struck me most about heaven is that there's colors that you've never seen before there. Mm -hmm. So they're experiencing these colors everywhere. And then all of a sudden, the sun starts diving, right? Like the sun is crashing into the earth. And, and people, people were heard, freaking like out, yelling and, and screaming, kind of screaming and panicking. Yeah. And they thought it was the end of the world. They thought mm -hmm. the vision, uh, the miracle was that this was the end of the world and the sun was going to crash and explode and kill everyone. But then it started going back and zigzagged back into place. And here's a really interesting thing is that once the sun went back into its place, it started to shine again like normal. But again, remember it was a rainy and muddy day. People all reported that their clothes were immediately dry, the mud of the ground had dried, and it became everything dry in a beautiful day. Mm -hmm. I mean, if that's not Mary calling her shot and saying, I'm going to give a miracle and there it's in front of 30 to 100,000 people and that happens, I don't know what is. Mm -hmm. There yeah. had to be great anticipation for this miracle for that many people to show up. And, and it's interesting you use the word anticipation. Mm -hmm. because, great, great anticipation. Yeah. And, and you, you people know. People came from villages that were from far away. The news had traveled. Mm -hmm. um, this was something that, you know, I, I guess had... The, you know, obviously God wanted so many people there, but the time it took for this to evolve mm -hmm. with these little children is, mm -hmm. is pretty, uh, pretty amazing. And, and everything was pointing to that last yes. apparition. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the urgency of being present for that was, was uh, key and that there was going to be a sign accommodated. And this being the sign has left a lasting impact through generations to our own. We didn't live in the early 20th century, but we live as a result of what happened mm -hmm. in Fatima. And, and it's been communicated and affirmed by the church that, that this is truly something that uh, it, it can be uh, believable yeah. in, within, the, within the faith. You know, I, I just think about what it takes to get a, mm -hmm. an event or a concert filled up today. With our modern forms of communication and million-dollar marketing budget, good luck getting thirty to 100,000 people to show up for anything. Mm -hmm. And this is in 1917 when you have radio and maybe a few telegraphs and stuff, and people showed up. So the anticipation had to be astounding mm -hmm. for that many people in that type of communication system show up. Mm -hmm. The Bishop of Fatima in 1930, I wanted to use his quote, but he said that this is worthy of belief, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and it is. I mean, when you see the kids, you know, acting in the way that they are, praying the way that they are and expressing what they're expressing, they don't have a worldview and a knowledge. It's not the social media age of their mm -hmm. time. They aren't. They aren't exposed to everything going on, and they don't know all the ins and outs of all this political philosophy and 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 uh, ideologies. Mm -hmm. You know, and and the fact that they are communicating a message that would be applicable to the whole world in the face of all this evil and offer such consolation and peace as a result is is really a manifestation of of something divine. Right, and that's why I'm so excited to go to Fatima is to experience this place to see this this actual place where this happened and smell that air there and try to get a sense of that mystical thing that happened. And so if, you, if you're interested, you can go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash Fatima and learn more. We'll tell you more about the trip later, but um, it's going to be so interesting to, we're going to get a chance to venerate the tombs of these saints um, and Lucia dos Santos, which is now underneath this, this great shrine there. But I think one of the things that's most fascinating to people about these visions not only was there this miracle and this great occurrence, but I think the thing that really made it fascinating to people who weren't there and spread it throughout the world is that there was three secrets revealed to these children. And those secrets have done a lot of things. Number one, they've shown potential things that will happen in the future and have come true. And there are also very dire warnings about the end of the world. So people's imaginations and curiosity run wild mm -hmm. over these. So the first secret is is a frightening one, and uh, it's it's related to hell. So we'll just kind of read this to you. Our Lady showed us a great sea of fire, which seemed to be under the earth. Plunged in this fire were demons and souls in human form, like transparent burning embers, all blackened and burnished bronze, floating about in the conflagration, now raised into the air by the flames that issued from within themselves, together with great clouds of smoke, now falling back on every side like sparks in a huge fire without weight or equilibrium, 
and amid shrieks and groans of pain and despair, which horrified us and made us tremble with fear, the demons could be distinguished by their terrifying and repulsive likeness to frightful and unknown animals, all black and transparent. The, this vision lasted but an instant. How can we ever be grateful enough to our kind Heavenly Mother who had already prepared us by promising in the first apparition to take us to heaven? Otherwise, I think we would have died of fear and terror. And, uh, you know, there are many mystics throughout the history of the church that that describe apparitions or, or visions of hell. And this this fits within the scope of, of these uh, experiences. But it is, it's, it's terribly alarming. And, you know, the death that, that occurs in the heart and the mind and the soul at the very sight of it um, is, is something that is just absolutely uh, it makes you shiver. Um, I, you know, I think Mary showed this to the children to really impress on them why the need for reparations and prayer was so important, because this is what happens to those poor souls. And w what we have the opportunity to do here on earth, yeah. you know, like the fact that we have the opportunity on earth to make holy, sacrificium, you know, to, to make sacrifices for others, to pray for others, to serve others. Um, to become a slave of all for the name of Christ and, and to bring peace into the world. You know, this, the corporal works of mercy. You know, the, this is our opportunity now. But when everybody's living for themselves and it's a, it's a, a grasp after power, mm -hmm. um, it creates a, a very treacherous world. And what, what is the result of that is destruction. And it's destruction in, in the forms that we're hearing uh, the kids express through this first secret. Yeah. Now, now, the second secret of Fatima, like I said, is kind of had been the kids had been prepared for this by that first vision. So this is coming from Lucia dos Santos's own memoirs. This is what her own words are. And that's what Father Rich read, too. So she said, Mary said, you have seen hell where the souls of poor sinners go to save them. God wishes to establish in the world devotion to my immaculate heart. If what I say to you is done, many souls will be saved and there will be peace. This war is going to end, but if people do not cease offending God, a worse one will break out during the pontificate of Pope Pius XI. When you see a night illuminated by an unknown light, know that this is the great sign given to you by God that he is about to punish the world for its crimes by means of war, famine, and persecutions of Christians and of the Holy Father. To prevent this... I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart and the communion of reparation on the first Saturdays. If my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. If not, she will spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the church. The good will be martyred. The Holy Father will have much to suffer. Various nations will be annihilated. In the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. The Holy Father will consecrate uh -huh. Russia to me and she shall be converted and a peace a period of peace will be granted to the world. You know, I don't, I don't know about you guys, but, you know, it's like at the more that we go into this scientific progress and, and like the more that we, we develop pride, you know what I'm saying? Like the more we cut ourselves off from God. Well, we've and, got a great big digital tower of Babel where we're just flaunting well, that's, it. That's what, we're, that's what we're doing. And it's like, you know, we don't look at wars and famines as a result of human sin. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we haven't like, we, you know, we're just going to scientifically analyze and we're going to comment, you know, we're going to be in our social media wars and, and, and continue to argue with each other. It's like, when are we going to recognize that this is all offensive to God and what's being called for, for each of us is to make reparation, to pray, to make sacrifices, to do penance. And, and I, I'm seeing it on a grassroots level with, with people that are responding in that way. And I think more and more people are coming back to church. We're seeing that with the talk show all the time with, with people that are expressing that they're getting into the church. But, you know, I just hope that this show, but also, you know, bringing back this, this apparition from history, this, this previous century, 100 years ago, that we could realize that, you know, war, famine, all of these things are related to human sinfulness. And that's been held by the church for many, many, many years. You know, something really interesting. They mentioned that great sign in the sky. And this was 1917. Uh, and this is before anyone conceived of a second world war. But on January 25th, 1938, there was the largest aurora borealis recorded in modern human history. 
as far south as Africa. North Africa, you're seeing the aurora borealis. Now, you think of this as something like you see in Norway or Alaska or far reaches of Canada. Uh, people in Paris reported they were calling the fire station because they thought the city was on fire. Uh, communications devices were shut down for 12 hours. It was like one of the largest solar flares ever recorded and created this aurora borealis. This is in 1938. One month later, Hitler annexed Austria and took the Sudetenland. And the war really began in earnest. There really was, and Sister Lucia said, this was that sign that this war was going to happen because immediately after that, this war kicked off in earnest and the things that caused the great second war, this conflict, started to occur. So in this third secret, it was a, a vision of the death of the Pope and other religious figures uh, that was transcribed by the Bishop of, of the Fatima District. Mm -hmm. And this one's the one that kind of bears a lot of controversy behind it and a lot of conspiracy. Um, you know, so after the two parts, which I have already explained, at the left of Our Lady and a little above, we saw an angel with a flaming sword in his left hand flashing it gave out flames that looked as though they would set the world on fire, but they died out in contact with the splendor that Our Lady radiated towards him from her right hand. Pointing to the earth with his right hand, the angel cried out in a loud voice, penance, penance, penance. And we saw an immense light that is God, something similar to how people appear in a mirror when they pass in front of it. A bishop dressed in white, we had the impression that it was the Holy Father. Other bishops, priests, religious men and women going up a steep mountain at the top of which there was a big cross of rough hewn trunks as of cork tree with the bark. Before reaching there, the Holy Father passed through a big city, half in ruins and half trembling with halting step. Afflicted with pain and sorrow, he prayed for the souls of the corpses he met on his way. Having reached the top of the mountain on his knees at the foot of the big cross, he was killed by a group of soldiers with fire bullets and arrows at him. And in the same way, there died one after another, the bishops, priests, religious men and women, and various lay people of different ranks and positions. Beneath the two arms of the cross, there were two angels, each with a crystal aspersorium in his hand and in which gathered up the blood of the martyrs and with it sprinkled the souls that were making their way to God. That's, that's, that's a big revelation. Mm -hmm. Now, what made that so conspiratorial and such a, a, a matter of, um, I don't know, uh, of gossip was that this was written down in 1943. Mm -hmm. And she didn't want to write it down, but she had gotten sick. She had, she had um, a really serious illness, and her bishop commanded her to write this down. Um. And she didn't want to because Mary said she uh, she shouldn't. Mm -hmm. But her Carmelite vows are to obey your superiors. So she ended up um, agreeing to do so because she wanted to keep her vows. She wrote it down but then said it should not be revealed until 1960 until anyone besides the Pope. Mm. So when the, you know new popes were elected during the interim, they would get this envelope and they would read this. Mm -hmm. And you got to imagine, like, hey, I'm the Pope, the big thing. And then you read this and you're like, oh, man, this doesn't sound good for Mr. Pope here, right? Mm -hmm. But so then it was supposed to be revealed in 1960, but then the Vatican said, we are not going to reveal it and we don't think it ever will be revealed. So then people's imaginations go absolutely bonkers, right? Mm -hmm. People are like, well, what is it? They think it's the end of the world, nuclear war, and they, they don't know. But I think the story kind of really comes to fruition in 1981, and that's with your boy, John JP Paul II. II. Yeah, and, and that was uh, the assassination attempt. And on what day? Mm -hmm. May 13th. So, Which is the first apparition of Our Lady mm -hmm. in Fatima. Mm -hmm. And, and that, again, all those political tensions rising to the forefront of, of you know, Europe and the world— and then, you know, during the Cold War and, and the effects of communism and all this building up, this crescendo, and John Paul II being a champion of, of freedom mm -hmm. and, and a great philosopher that clearly uh, presented a philosophy very much in, in, in offense to the communist ideology. To the errors ideology. of Russia. Yeah, yeah, and the errors of Russia. Like, it's, it's, very, it's very evident that, there, you know, these ties can absolutely be, uh, be drawn here. Yeah, and a lot of people say that, that that assassination attempt was kind of funded or pushed by Soviet forces mm -hmm. or Soviet intelligence. 
but he survived that attack, mm -hmm. right? And he attributed his survival to the intercession of Our Lady of Fatima. And that's why he took fragments from the from the shelling of that bullet. That was pulled out of his body. Mm -hmm. And placed it in the crown of Our Lady of Fatima. Yeah. A year later. That's right. On May 13th, 1982. Mm -hmm. um, and then people all, a lot of times say, well, Mary never had her wish granted and Russia wasn't consecrated to her. But in 1984, Pope John Paul II consecrated the whole world and, in, and Russia to the um, Immaculate Heart. So did Pope Pius XII. Mm -hmm. um, in 1942. In 1942. And Sister Lucia was asked, does this satisfy the, the, the request of Our Lady? And she said, yes. And here's what happened. 1984, he does this. Seven years later, the Soviet Union falls, and we had a long period of peace. Mm -hmm. So I really think that that had come to fulfillment. Pope Benedict said that it had, but he also said that it's more of a uh, malleable or elastic thing. But everyone said that that prediction and, and, and secret had come to fulfillment and been fully revealed. Mm -hmm. Now, we had Pope Francis reconsecrate Ukraine and Russia to the Immaculate Heart. And, and Ryan, you were talking about it. I mean, how many times have you done a reconsecration? You know, things can be reconsecrated. Yeah, I've, uh, there's been an instrumental prayer in my life is consecrating myself using the, the Louis de Montfort consecration prayer, and um, it's had a lot of impact in my life, and I have uh, re-consecrated myself and also my kids and my family and the work that we do and I do. Um, How many times? So, 10, I don't know, 15? More than that, wow. probably 20. So. so, I mean, things mm -hmm. can be reconsecrated. Mm -hmm. It's not like there's one consecration and it's a magical binding spell that locks a door or something like we that. We renew our baptism every time we go into the church and bless ourselves with holy water. We renew our baptismal identity every time we go to confession and, and re receive the Eucharistic species of Jesus' body and mm -hmm. blood. Like yeah. the, the, This renewal process is very, very important, and it's important right now in our in our time to, to do that. And that's why we're doing this trip to Fatima. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we are going there explicitly to pray to pray for the world, to offer sacrifices, to enter into some disciplines, and to visit some of these most historic locations associated mm -hmm. with the lives of Lucia, Jacinto, and Francisco, and and to visit their tombs, to pray in those, you know, to pray there so that we can renew our commitments so that we can enter into a time of peace, especially in the context of all this war, famine, and strife. Yeah, and now just being just a little over 100 years later, I think it's a really great time. And this is going to be everyone's first real opportunity to get onto a pilgrimage after COVID. I mean, mm -hmm. COVID has us locked down for two years. Um, we've been trying to go on a pilgrimage and haven't had the opportunity, and we finally have. So like Ryan said earlier, I think, you know, we waited to do this episode. We probably would have done it two years ago, and I don't I don't remember why we didn't, but it seems so fitting that we did so that now it kind of goes in conjunction with this pilgrimage that we're doing to Fatima, which is coming up this year, November 5th through the 12th, 2022. So, yeah, we're very excited about this trip. We do want you to stop by our website at catholictalkshow.com forward slash Fatima to see all the details of the trip. But let's share some of those. there's a lot of details. Yeah, let's share some of the highlights of, of where we're going. Sure. So, I mean, obviously we're going on this trip primarily to go to the Shrine, the, the shrine Basilica mm -hmm. of Our Lady of Fatima, where we will see the place where she appeared, celebrate Mass, get to pray together. We'll get to pray at the tombs of the three visionaries of Fatima. So that's the primary thing of the trip. But, you know, we heard about St. Anthony's Feast Day being, you know, June right. 13th. We're also visiting the birthplace of St. Anthony yeah, of Padua. And, and, and a huge church dedicated. I mean, St. Anthony of Padua is the miracle worker saint. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a really cool thing to see that. And, and I mean, how many times have we lost something? That's the saint that we pray to, you mm -hmm. know. So maybe if you're on this trip and you've lost something, you might have a special intention there. That'll be, that'll be a good time for that. Um, we're also going to a city called Santarum. And we're going to be going to uh, a church that has a 13th century Eucharistic miracle. So we're going to be going to Our Lady of Fatima. We're going to be going to the birthplace of St. Anthony. We're going to be going to the site of a Eucharistic miracle. We're going to be going to uh, the monastery of St. Jerome to pray. We're going to be having Mass every day. There's going to be opportunities for confession, but we're also going to get to do some fun stuff. So we're going to be going to one place called Aviero, which is considered the Venice of Portugal. It's got all the same canals, so there's going to be a lot of cool shopping and places to see, gondola rides. Um, we're going to be going to Porto, which is the home of the world-famous Porto wine, of port wine. So we're going to have great wine-tasting opportunity, and we're going to have all kinds of 
you know, time to eat, time to talk, time to hang out and play, but then also time to pray together. And this is all professionally planned. You know, we're, ha- we're staying at beautiful hotels. Your flights are included in this. So if you go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash Fatima, you can sign up. And this is definitely going to sell out. You know, like I said, demand has been building because everyone's stuck in their house. And our last one, when we were intending to go to Poland, completely sold out. And I guarantee this one will. So if you want to make sure that you can go on this trip with us, catholictalkshow.com forward slash Fatima. Yeah, pilgrimages are life changing. And, and, you know, we definitely want to encourage that. Uh, for each one of our listeners and viewers, um, if you can't make our Fatima trip, try to make pilgrimage, you know, and, and we're going to be doing these Patreon hangouts and places of pilgrimage within the United States, mm-hmm. just on like little day trips that you would come meet us if you're one of our patrons and our supporters. A big sense of gratitude to all of you. And we thank you for connecting with us today on this very important topic, sharing the fruits of one of the greatest apparitions of Our Lady throughout the history of the church and one that is still pertinent today. We hope that these visions that we've covered generally pique your interest because there's so much more to learn about what occurred in Fatima with these three children, the apparition of the angels that preceded. Lucia had other apparitions the throughout her life. The prayers and everything the associated with it. The prayers that come from it as well. Um, you know, and, and the prayers that the angels taught are mm-hmm. some of the most beautiful prayers. I'll make sure there's links to that so that we didn't get an opportunity to get into that, but you can read more about some of those things, mm-hmm. those prayers and stuff like that. So check out those show notes and make sure you're hitting that subscribe button. Give us a thumb Thumbs up and put your prayer intentions in the comment section below. Let's offer our prayers up and really fulfill what Our Lady's calling us to with that daily rosary, honoring her on first Saturdays and entering into a time of penance and the deepest solidarity of prayer. United we stand and we stand against every form of evil. And let's truly, truly walk the faith and continue to keep us in prayer. God bless and we'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.